And today I'm going to talk about financial assets and I'm going to share The Great Taking, which is a book uh, I think everyone should read. It's from David Rogers Webb and thegreattaking.com. It's free and there's also a documentary he made. Uh, and I'm going to try and parse it out and compress it. It's a big story. Uh, and I'm going to put a few other little things in there as well for your entertainment. So basically, this graph I made a few weeks ago was very popular and it got me on Dr. Drew a few days ago and, and various other platforms. So people seem to like it and I made a PDF version you can download and stick in the fridge. And it's just a root cause diagram which we use in engineering, a very simplified version of bubbles and arrows to just show how everything connects together. We use it to help with senior management in a complex problem uh, because they're not always the smartest. So globalist, quote, utopia, what the Rockefellers, the WEF, the Club of Rome, and I can go on all day, what all these elites have put together over 70 years and what they desire. And my daughter actually said it best, I think. Uh, she said, oh, and this is the summer of 2020. As I was talking to her about this stuff, she said, they want an ant farm, don't they? And I said, that's exactly what they want. So they don't want to depopulate and kill all the ants. They just want a nice ant farm like China. And they're all looking with jealous eyes to China over the last 50 years. So that's essentially it at its simplest. So that's their utopia. And basically, all these disparate things that people see going on, often the person in the street is kind of thinking, well, I know everything's gone crazy, but how can it all connect together? So this helps, perhaps. The COVID-19 program, for that's what it was, uh, gender and all the trans nonsense, where did that come from? <laughs> climate, <laughs> climate and CO2, right? Surely that's a different thing. Financial and central bank digital currencies, uh, mass migration, well, that's unto itself, surely. Uh, Anti-meat propaganda and the war on farmers, you'll all have seen. Uh, education and the children. So I'll just go through quickly if I can. So mass formation was used, techniques to get lockstep authoritarianism. And another thing that was aimed for with this whole program was weakening society. And you're going to see this red bubble come up a lot uh, because that's the side benefit of every strategy being deployed. Weakening society raises all of their bolts, as I'm sure you've kind of seen and sensed. So uh, that delivers towards, obviously, their, their vision. Uh, transfer of power and creation of a biosecurity state. So the WHO was given enormous power through COVID, and that was a huge benefit towards their goals and delivers to the goals. Partner profiteering, sometimes missed, not just Big Pharma, right? The funders of the WEF are all the corporations. Way more than Big Pharma were wetting their beak during COVID, right? Think of it like mafia. You allow the other families to wet their beaks, you know, keep everyone together. So you had mask manufacturers, Amazon, big box stores, small businesses shut down. All the big guys could make an absolute fortune. I could go on and on. So that's the beak wetting, and it's very, very useful. It enhances the funding source to the World Economic Forum and to the Agenda 2030 goals, because all the corporates are delighted and it bolsters those alliances with all the corporates. The corporates know their bottom line is shooting up and therefore they like it. They like what's going on, even if they're not too sure about some of the stuff. And it's all self-reinforcing towards the globalist utopia. Censorship apparatus, they made censorship great again in 2020. <laughs> Hadn't seen censorship really in a century in the West. But they managed to pull it off and get people to kind of accept it because we're saving granny and all this stuff, right? Nonsense. Um, that weakens society like nothing else, of course. If you shut vo down voices, it's a major problem. And uh, great words by Richard there, exactly right. Uh, you know, we need to counter it in a whack-a-mole way. So the gender and trans, that's kind of different. Well, no, it erodes fundamental truths. So we have up and down, black and white, male and female. They've actually gone after one of the big ones. And when you erode fundamental truths in society and you use mass formation in the media, it weakens society. It's divisive, it confuses people, and people kind of keep their mouth shut. Uh, so that's the reason for all of this stuff. And it's funded by major corporate uh, moneyed interests. And the Pritzker family, billionaires in America, have set up foundations to drive this nonsense. 
and course delivers the goals. Climate and CO2, <laughs> there's a lady yesterday thinking, well, you know, is it really all nonsense? Surely there's good people working within those spheres. Uh, 50 to 60 years of funding have delivered the absurdity that most scientists agree there's a catastrophe. And I can tell you, in my own opinion, having looked at the data, it's complete nonsense. Uh, but the climate thing, partner profiteering, windmills, green energy, everyone's wetting their beaks. And our tax dollars are being poured into these charlatans. Uh, centralized energy control, that's another huge goal. And that weakens society, of course. When you centralize energy, society's kind of whole well-being is based on energy. It's just the way it is. Uh, so they're going to centralize it if they can. And wealth transfer, of course, is massive here and that weakens society too, just like COVID did. And all of that leads to the goals. So financial and CBDC, probably the biggest threat we have coming is central bank digital currency. Uh, that centralizes financial control. And what it also does is it gives powerful censorship ability. So social credit score, turn off your bank account. You saw Trudeau in Canada, what he did without CBDC. You get CBDC and they can do anything they want, unfortunately. Uh, and that will weaken society like nothing else. Uh, mass migration, this is a century old strategy. It goes back to the Kalergi plan. I was talking to Sandy yesterday about it. Basically, they knew if they wanted a super state of Europe, the pan-European Union back in the 20s, they'd need to undermine nationality and national sovereignty and culture because all these disparate countries in Europe didn't want to become one blob, you know, in a super state. So you had to undermine them. And how you do it is you bring in large numbers, flood the zone with very different cultures that don't really integrate, and you break down the individual countries. Uh, it's a clever strategy, and they're correct. Erode nationalism, weaken society, and it goes towards the goals. Now, I'm going to move pretty quickly. Anti-meat propaganda war on farmers, again, wetting beaks. You know, fake milk, fake food, fake burgers, fake meat. All of that stuff makes a lot of money. And it's all, of course, uh, junk food, ultra processed. Other thing it does is dependency. So you take away natural, local, nutrient dense foods, meats, fish and eggs, as much as you can, hence the war on farmers. And then you make people dependent on a corporate pipeline of processed junk, uh, using the excuse of climate, of course. Uh, that's their excuse. And that weakens society because if you had society in the morning could only eat meat, fish and eggs and vegetables, there was no other food source, within a month or two, society would look dramatically different, visually. Half of pharma companies would have to shut down because hypertension would fall off the map and mental acuity and general mental strength would increase. So another side benefit is you really weaken society when you take away their meat. <laughs> And that goes towards the goals. Last one, this is a broad one, children and education, that's indoctrination and undermining the family always. That's a common theme. Um, it's a Marxist type hotbed now, the universities, and they're all teaching them this kind of stuff and all the other climate stuff. And it's a great strategy and they're doing very well so far. War is also another tool and I think we're gonna see more war. <coughs> in the coming few years, you know, and even this morning, my friends in Dubai told me Iran's going to be in within a few weeks. Here we go. So not hard to uh, predict. So anyway, that was just an intro. I thought I'd give something other than The Great Taking because this is a bit heavy and there's a lot of text. So this is the book, uh, thegreattaking.com is the website. Go and download the book for free. And because I'm a kind of a YouTube person, I have to, <laughs> I have, I have to make a nice thumbnail, so I did that kind of, and it worked. It got a lot of views. Uh, it's the taking of collateral across the world, everything, all of it. And it's kind of the end game of a long cycle of debt, and we're heading now into financial serious turbulence. And that's why all of this, uh, what I'm going to show you, has been put in place. Included in the great taking by the top banks and the Bank of International Settlements, so the secured creditors who will get everything in the case of an implosion of the derivatives market, uh, all financial assets, deposits of banks, stocks and bonds, all underlying property of public corporations, anything linked to debt or owned through a broker, it's all covered. 
property finance with any amount of debt can similarly be taken. So the rule here is own it outright, whatever you want to make sure you keep. Uh, this guy here, you all love him I know, um, the Great Reset, you know, and this is very connected. The Great Reset they're talking about relates very closely to this. And someone in the UK, I forget now at the moment, did this chart and it's a simple version of a big talk I usually give. I'm not giving it today because I want to do the, the taking stuff. But I usually focus on the Rockefellers, the WF, Club of Rome, Council for Foreign Relations and this layer. Because yes, the banks are probably really behind it all, but I don't have documented proof and I only go through stuff that's fully documented. Uh, for obvious reasons, I, I hope. Uh, but it's a fascinating structure that's developed over decades. And the proclaimed Great Reset includes all these innovations and etc. But it's really unprecedented concentration of wealth in the hands of a very few. And I think, and David thinks, the intention is at some point when things implode, which they kind of have to, uh, they want to make sure that all the wealth can be taken by them. Right, and that's essentially it. And depriving people weakens society. So there's a, always that benefit, always that benefit. And why now? Well, it's really the private ownership of all central banks and all money creation. Started with the Fed in 1913, a private institution, nothing to do with federal government. And the Bank of England, private institution with hidden shareholders, it's nothing to do with the government. So these central banks are all privately owned. And they worked for 100 years to really concentrate their power and their control over political parties, governments, intelligence agencies, State Department is, is enormous. And, and the WF is, is just one example. So a quick concept, velocity of money, it's the GDP divided by the money supply. So if your GDP or your real world growth is, is slowing down or low, or if your money supply is increased, which it has been, enormously over the last 20 years. I mean, the printers are just running on full bore. Uh, but the key is velocity of money when it goes low, it's very dangerous uh, and it kind of predicts an impending major crash. And the velocity of money is now, or at least in 2020, at its lowest point since the Great Depression. And similar graphs of what was happening in the Great Depression are now becoming manifest now across a lot of different metrics. So we're heading into a very, very dodgy time. And I think that's why they rushed in the Great Taking over the last few years and made sure it was in place. So first step of the Great Taking is dematerialization. And all this is, is they had to get all the paper certificates of stocks, which gave you real ownership. They had to get rid of all paper and make it all electronic. And that was going on in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, before they take the legal ownership of everything. So there's no property rights now to securities held in book entry form in any jurisdiction globally, period. That is over since 2016. So any stocks and shares you own through a broker and even bank balances and, and any forms of debt, they are all now connected to the world derivatives market and they're all used as collateral. So even if you have specifically said for certain stocks and bonds you have, you, do not, you want them segregated and the broker says, oh, of course, and segregates them away from the pool, that's illegal. They are in the pool. All of them are in the pool and they're collateral for the derivatives market. It's just a legal fact now. In the grand scheme to confiscate all of this, David believes they will confiscate. I'm not sure they get away with it, but they've done the work. Dematerialization was essential. And the planning and efforts, 50 years ago they started, the CIA was assigned to the mission, not a bank, Central Intelligence Agency was given this job. And the project leader was William Denser, uh, a career CIA operative. He had been decades in CRA operations before this. And even though he had no background in any aspect of banking or finance, he was appointed New York State Superintendent of Banks by Nelson Rockefeller, right? So everything that goes on, and this was new to me a year ago, I met David in Sweden in September, always back to Rockefeller or other cronies. So it's a really tight group. He was chairman and CEO of the newly formed DTC. That was a, a kind of a structure to enable this great taking. 
and it eventually became the model for the Central Securities Depository, CSD and the CCP. And you don't really need to know these, but these are huge legal structures to enable what the goal I told you was. The second step is security entitlement. They need to take away the securities ownership from everyone, even super rich individuals. They're all going to be affected by this. And what they did basically, and I just mentioned, since four centuries ago, securities were fully owned securely by the person who owned them. That's why they were called securities probably. And they were personal property and laws everywhere protected that. And this is no longer the case. Uh, so a simple analogy, I didn't write it down. So if you bought a car, and by the way, this does not apply to a car you own, uh, but it's a good analogy David used. So you buy a car and you pay for it from a dealer. But then the dealer goes and offers your car as collateral uh, for other deals that he's doing, even though you're off driving it and you paid for it. And then it gets offered as collateral by another person, etc. That's the derivatives market. So you find out one day, uh oh, dealer went broke. Well, that's not my problem. Uh, but it is in this structure because your car will be seized because it was collateral the dealer used. You just didn't know it. And that's what's happened with all securities, stocks and bonds and all the other things. They are all pooled assets to secure the derivatives market used as collateral and if the derivatives market goes broke or the broker, uh, this legal infrastructure is there to give you a small slice of what you thought you owned. Essentially, all securities owned by the public in all these things, right, are underpinning the derivatives complex. So you don't own them, and that's legally a fact. And the enormous task of doing this uh, started 50 years ago. And as David said, the people who actually put this in place, a surprisingly small number of people, uh, they're dead now. But the people who've come after them keep going. And he said, it's just insanity, but it keeps going. And no one knows about it. And that's the problem. Awareness is huge. People who, especially high net worth individuals, have to know this and then begin to make noise about it. And that will stop it. You know, there's states in America now, two of them, who are trying to bring in laws to overturn this. So remember the bad guys, they, they work in the shadows. If, if the sunlight comes in, they scurry away like cockroaches. And, and that would happen if there was awareness of this. So that's the, the mission here is awareness. These are the key facts. Ownership of securities of property has been replaced with a security entitlement. So you have an entitlement to a piece of what you used to own outright. And it's a contractual claim. All securities are held in unsegregated pooled form. And even if you try and restrict them from that, they are all in the same pool, legally. And all account holders, included those who have prohibited use of their securities as collateral, uh, that'll be signed off, box ticked. Uh, it's irrelevant, it's illegal. Uh, they can only receive a pro rata share of the assets if there's a problem. You cannot be outside the system unless you have physical metal, gold, land, with deeds. It's the only way out. And revindication, which used to be a legal thing, the taking back of your securities if your broker goes insolvent, that was the norm, is absolutely prohibited now. It has been removed from law, your ability to say, oh, the broker's gone bust, well, just send my Apple shares to broker B. That's illegal. You can't take them back. Uh, this stuff is more, I won't go into detail here because it gets heavy, but safe harbor has been assured for secured creditors. And you'd say, well, who are the secured creditors that I have to go after my assets in the event of a problem and try and get a piece back? Uh, it's Morgan Stanley and the big banks. So when the implosion comes, the big banks will hoover up all the small banks uh, after the collapse, big collapse probably, and the Bank of International Settlements, the central banks, it'll be all the top level of banks. They're the secured creditors for everything, right? So go figure. Uh, and the documentation of this is irrefutable. So when I in Sweden saw David, it was 10 p.m. at night, and this guy didn't know who he was. Within three minutes, I was transfixed because he was showing legal documents. And I realized this is actually all true. And I, I, was, I was surprised. I was surprised. 
What about Europe, you'd say? So this is American State Department, CIA, and they went through all 50 states and got these laws in over 50 years, and they stayed away from the Supreme Court and the federal level because they knew there'd be questions asked. So they did it state by state, right? Sneaky. Uh, but what about Europe? We're okay. Uh, no. April 2004, European Commission, which is basically the communist Soviet system brought to Europe. That's the European Commission. It's like the Politburo uh, in Soviet era. Um, they said, oh, we need a legal certainty group to address problems of legal uncertainty around ownership. There was no problem. There was no problem, but they felt there was a problem. But they went to the US who were forcing them to do this and the Deputy General went to the Fed, the top of the top in New York, the Federal Reserve Bank, and they asked them a lot of questions because Europe actually wasn't even sure what this was about. <laughs> but they knew they had to do it because the US said so. And when the US says jump, you jump. That's, That's it. it. So they asked them, mm, legal system, uh, what, respect of what legal system? And uh, the Fed said, well, it's Article 8 and 9. And that's what I mentioned to you. The US had this fully legalized over 50 years. So there you go. Um, where securities are held in pooled form, blah, 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 does the investor have rights attaching to particular securities in the pool? No. <laughs> they have a pro rata share in the interests of their asset held by the intermediary, like a broker. This is true even if investor positions are so-called segregated. So what I said, it, it doesn't matter if they say they're segregated, they're not, by law. Is the investor protected against the insolvency of an intermediary, like a broker or something? If so, how? An investor is always vulnerable to a securities intermediary that does not itself have interests that cover everything. In other words, if the intermediary goes broke, um, they no, they don't. The secured creditor has control over the financial asset and will have priority. And that's JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, BIS. That's the people at the top. They have the security. And if the security is, is a clearing corporation, the claims of, yeah, same thing. So that's the way it is. What rules protect a transferee acting in good faith? That's a good question. Article 8 protects the purchaser of a financial asset against the claims of an entitlement holder to a property interest. And what that means is, basically, we now have an entitlement, not ownership. So the big boys are protected against the owners, the entitlement owners. They're protected against them. Um, Essentially, unless the purchaser was involved, now that's a purchaser purchasing off a bank or a derivatives complex, unless they actually did something illegal, the entitlement holder will be precluded from raising a claim. They'll get, they'll get the crumbs later if there's something left, right? And remember, entitlement holder is us now. We used to be the securities owner. Now we're entitled owners, but it's all been taken away. How are shortfalls, blah, 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 dealt with? The only rule in such instances is that the security entitlement holders, that's for people who think they're owners, simply share pro rata in the interests held by the intermedia. Uh, shortfalls uh, occur frequently due to fails or other reasons. Oh, they, do they say? Shortfalls occur frequently due to fails and for other reasons, but are of no general consequence except in the case of a securities intermediary's insolvency. So they're kind of saying, look, ah, there's problems sometimes, but really, don't worry about this. This whole thing is only when there's an insolvency. But of course, we know there's going to be a massive insolvency coming worldwide. Does the treatment of shortfalls differ according to whether it is there's no fault for the intermediary? If fault fraud or a fault negligence or breach of duty. And essentially what the Fed says, regardless of fault, fraud or negligence of the intermediary that got in trouble, the entitlement owner only has a pro rata share. So even if your broker broke the law, it doesn't matter. And they're saying this applies universally regardless. And that's directly from the horse's mouth from the Fed to the European Union, all documented and published. No one knows about it, but the Fed told them, yeah, the owners are, are no longer owners. That's the way it is. And 
I'll go through this quickly. Uh, yeah, David was asking qui bono, who benefits? And it's certainly not citizens, even extremely wealthy citizens. It's just the top of the heap benefit. They hoover up everything. And the reason for this legislation on legal certainty is demand for collateral by market participants. That's demand for collateral by the banking system uh, into the derivatives market, which is enormous now. It's bigger than the whole world's GB GDP. When it goes pop, <laughs> it'll be a big noise. And uh, that's it. Market participants is a euphemism, yeah, for powerful creditors who control governments. That's essentially it. And they have worked with governments and legal departments and CIA, etc., to make sure it was set up like this. So but they might not trigger it, but why did they spend 70 years a huge amount of money and effort to put this legally in place to not use it and that's why David reckons I'm inclined to agree if things go bang badly they'll probably use it harmonization and I'm going to go pretty quickly now certain secured creditors must be given legal certainty to client assets globally without exception and I think I've kind of already gone through that that's what they went about but what about Sweden now and the reason he went there is Sweden and Finland by 2010 were the only countries in Europe that their national laws prevented this being valid, right? So he went to Sweden, he bought a farm and all, had a great time. And then he realized, uh-oh, Finland and Sweden were the only ones who, who had the traditional legal arrangement of you owning your securities. And you could own government bonds and they were safe. Right? So they're like a, an oasis, a haven. In 2006, the Legal Certainty Group identified Sweden and Finland as having problematic law. So they wouldn't even allow a couple of Nordic to be outside of this. So that's how vehement they are. And what happened then? Euroclear was brought in, uh, used a Belgian legal kind of construct to pretty much buy out Sweden's banking kind of asset ownership model and circumvent the Swedish law, okay? So that was Euroclear. And there are now these CSDs and these other structures that operate as an ICSD, which is the thing that has enabled this in America and the rest of the countries uh, under Belgian law. <laughs> so you can see the scabbing. Like they couldn't actually do it under Swedish law and they probably didn't want to bring awareness to it by changing the law because questions would be asked. So they actually did a roundabout way. They use Belgian law and a Belgian kind of shell company and made it own the Swedish assets in a, in a legal way to circumvent Sweden's law. And Finland did the same. And da 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 da, I won't go through this. Oh, this is when they did this, they did a disclosure. But no one published or talked about it. It was just there, you know. And there's a couple of excerpts here. In the unlikely event, of a short, unlikely event of a shortfall of securities, the client in question will not be able to claim a right of separation, i.e. ownership. That's the ordinary person, even if rich. Um, but will likely be considered as an unsecured creditor without priority. So the actual owner, same thing again, might have a bit of a claim. And then yada yada, um, that basically just says the same, but in gobbledygook text, but they're just disclosing because they have to legally, hey, we've done this. But of course, no newspaper, no financial paper, no one covered it, no one knows. He said even senior hedge fund managers, top people in finance, none of them know about this. It was quietly done through corporate law and, and other mechanisms all over the world. Uh, no one knows about it. So uh, this was more the stuff about Sweden. The royal decree was used. This is just circumventing their law. And uh, he actually had Swedish assets and he went and asked, let me see, I'm going to skip ahead a bit because a lot of this is detailed. Yeah, he had VP Conto in the Swedish Handelsbank and he had large amounts of money, but that became invalid after the changes in 14. So he went and he went to the SEB Securities and Exchange Board, I think, and he asked the Conto specialist, are securities held, blah, 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 can the securities held be re-vindicated in the event of failure of SEB or of Euroclear, the Belgian structure? So he's just saying, well, is my money, can it be re-vindicated, i.e. given back to me, if there is a failure? 
And the specialist didn't know because no one ever asked him. So he went off for a long time and then came back and said, well, it's insured up to around 20 or 25,000 euro. Yeah, but he probably had, I don't know, 10 or 20 million. And he confirmed the holding of securities at Euroclear was the change made uh, in whatever it was, 2014. And David said he seemed shocked himself to learn this. So the specialist had to go off and look it up, found out this, and actually couldn't believe himself that this was the case. He said he was, the guy was gobsmacked coming back to David. You know? So that, that'll show you the top people and even experts just don't know this. You know? Collateral management, inevitably following the everything bubble, which a lot of people are calling the current macroeconomic uh, state, will be the everything crash. And when that happens, this legal structure would allow the central clearing counterparties and the central banks to basically hoover up everything. Now, if they did that, I guess, you'd expect a revolution. You know, how would they pull it off? But if it happened and there was a crisis, you know, and granny was dying for lack of collateral, uh, a lot of people would, would kind of go, oh my God, it's a crisis. And, you know, and then they could offer everyone like 50,000 uh, central bank digital credits. Uh, we've got the solution. We're going to give everyone 50K and we're going to give you back X percent of the... You know, this has happened before, right? People have, have accepted madness uh, based on a narrative. So it's possible. And here he was just talking and he was very gracious of him. He gave me a slide pack. It was 280 slides. I got it down to 30. It took me a while. It's a big story. But it was a deliberate strategy. And he reckons... It was about ultimate complete power allowing no centers of resistance and he also feels it's about uh, deprivation subjugation you know just break people down further take away their financial certainties and it's all part of the ant farm model so um Probably gold will not be confiscated this time around. And if people are aware, in the 1930s, the US government confiscated all gold from people. It's kind of weird, but they did it, and people had to hand it in. Um, but this time it's different, because gold has not been targeted as an essential collateral backing, as was the case under the Federal Reserve Act in the 1930s. So this time they're allowing gold to go by. And that's why I think it's a very important asset to hold. Uh, but in this go-around, it is securities of all kinds, as I discussed globally, which have been set up as collateral backing underpinning the derivatives complex. So gold is still apparently a safe haven, physical gold. Paper gold wouldn't touch it, wouldn't put it in the bath, right? <laughs> Toilet paper. Because paper gold or like ETFs of gold or anything that represents gold, it's paper. And paper just gets into the conflagration when any of this happens. So it has to be physical. And some people, someone last night actually was saying that they wouldn't even leave the gold in a vault in Switzerland or London, they'd rather have it. Uh, and, and there's a lot to be said for that. Um, but he does say it doesn't assure indefinitely you will be allowed to keep your gold if this juggernaut continues in motion. But, but it's the best safe haven. And he believes that the people will become aware of this problem will push back and the problem won't happen you know but just in the case that the problem was allowed to happen the bad guys did really well he's just saying at some point then they'll be looking to have all physical assets tokenized and put into the new digital system so tokenize your couple of acres tokenize your physical gold and once it's tokenized it's forced into being paper asset digital asset so these guys are scumbags. I mean, the banks are the lowest form of human. I, I don't mean the lady you know who works at the, the desk in the local bank, but at the top, the people who have gotten to the top of the central banking system arguably are the worst people on the planet. So sorry, guys, but I've got to say it. Um, anything need to be said? 74 trillion is, is the derivative uh, positions that sometimes, actually sometimes single banks can have that much on their books because everything's re-hypothecated, re-collateralized. It keeps getting shared out again and again. One asset does around 50 people have it as, a, as an asset. It's nuts when you get into this stuff. The banking system is nuts, right? 
And he asks again, why are they doing it? What fig leaf will the deposit have to protect them from the protected class? And his best quote, and he gives some data I won't go into, in a real implosion using various different kind of algorithms and looking at values and, and loss of value, he thinks maybe 2% of the original value of the asset. That's his best guess. And yeah, it's a game of musical chairs. In the next global financial panic, you know, this kind of thing could be kicked into place. They spent 70 years creating it, a lot of work. Are they gonna just not use it? Hard to believe. And uh, yeah, musical chairs. Now, people I know, I went to Dubai to a conference. They asked me to do a couple of keynotes and they were kind of hedge fund managers, high net worth people a couple of weeks ago. Great sessions, working groups, fantastic few days. But they generally are keeping a lot of their assets in this system and they're still investing, but they're watching. And they all figure that if this comes close to fruition, they'll see it in advance. Now, the person in the street will not see it, will not have a clue. But people who are in the know can still invest. And even David Webb is still in the market. Um, but they're just in it very carefully and watching and watching. So if anything begins to look like this thing could be coming, they're just going to get everything out into physical assets. Um, he has some quotes at the end. I love them. He put four or five in. I count false words the foulest plague of all. So that was a shuttle shot. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> Eskilus. Eskilus. You see the British, I'm Irish, and I'm missing some of this more erudite stuff. I know. But uh, yeah, great quote. And two from Sun, Sun Tzu, all warfare is based on deception. Absolutely. You can do with a handful of people uh, what would require armies if you do it by deception, which is what they did. Those skilled at making the enemy move do so by creating a situation in which, to which he must conform. They entice him with something he is certain to take and with lures of ostensible profit, they await him in strength. So again, it's, it's art of war stuff. You know, you draw people in and you offer them things and give them narratives. And this is the last one. Never attempt to win by force what can be won by deception. The old Machiavelli. So I put in a bit of stuff at the end. A little bit about gold. I mean, for thousands of years, it's been and is still the only real money. In 2019, the central banks, the bad guys, moved gold from, I think, 2B <coughs> asset up to class one asset. And the only other class one asset for the past half century is US uh, de sovereign debt, the dollar. That's pure liquidity, pure asset. In 2019, they moved physical gold right up into class one, right? No one, no one covered that. It's very quiet, but I saw it. And that's when I started buying gold. If the central banks are doing it, <laughs> they're in the know. This article here, gold remonetization is much closer than many realize. And essentially, that's the thing. It will probably come back as the support for currency for the first time since Nixon dropped it in 71 and they started the money printers going insane. When they dropped the link to physical gold, they could print without limits. And all the, uh, all the politicians did it. All the countries followed the US. Keep printing, buying stuff to get voted in. And they never stopped. And that's why we're heading to the everything bubble. And they just noted there now, gold's remonetization is now officially a matter of global monetary policy because they read into reports that had come out quietly and between the lines they were effectively saying this. So gold's coming back. God knows what the value will go to, I, I have no idea. Colossal central bank buying in the last couple of years. They're piling up physical gold. And part of that is Ukraine and the US weaponized the dollar and confiscated Russia's assets and the whole world realized, oh my God, we can't trust the US. We, they, we might be out of favor some point in the future. So they're moving out of uh, US debt and they're moving into physical gold in the central banks because they know that's the place to go in these troubled times. And see that guy? <laughs> that's Augustin Carstens. He's the head of the central bank of central banks, the Bank of International Settlements. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, it's like his character is represented visually in other ways, uh, but someone did a funny joke and they put an arrow to this button here that's under significant strain, uh, and they put an arrow 
and they said, uh, trust in central banks. <laughs> Which is really good. I didn't get time to put it in there. So um, this one, my friend... <laughs> My friend the other night in, in Sweden, uh, he works with me on video editing, and uh, he just took this. He said, do you want me to do something funny with this? And I said, yeah, go ahead. So he made this in Photoshop, uh, and I put the people in here, and he put a puddle. Uh, but it, it's just funny. But these people are kind of scum, and all of them, and we need to still have a sense of humor and stoicism and laugh at them and ridicule them, because they are just disgusting people. And yeah, they have a lot of power, but I will beat them. Uh, purchases, it's mostly East that's buying physical gold at the moment. Uh, they're really piling up in China and Russia and the BRICS countries. Uh, that's going to get interesting. And this was out in 2018. I saw it back then. I remember thinking it's interesting. And it's just a joke that the US is literally letting the East build up physical gold, which is real money. Um, and the BRICS are pretty much throwing dollars over the net. And the question was like, what's going on here? You know, this, this financial, this was in something like Fortune, but the author was just wondering what's going on. And I, I think I explained some of it for you guys today. And uh, that did not come out, but it's just gold showing gold. In late 2020, after COVID, I did a lot of research on macroeconomics and I, I learned a lot of what we're talking about today. So I went in around 1830 with pension and, and some bits and pieces. It's 2355 now. It's really, rise, really rising fast now with the geopolitical instability and everything else. And um, yeah, I work with these. It's not an advertisement, but I work with Josh Shull and Pure Gold Company in London. I think they're the best guys out there or among the best. And uh, yeah, I give a link out at a lot of YouTubes. Just you get a year's free storage and you get a free kind of broker session. And they don't just push gold, they give a broad view of finances and advice, but they're obviously gold biased. Um, and just to say, in terms of, I can't give it financial advice, I mean, in fairness, but yes, I believe in metal. In 2020, I developed the phrase metal and dirt. We are in an age of metal and dirt, just based on what was happening in COVID. Uh, so physical metal, gold, silver, and, and maybe commodities and uh, land, land with ownership by deed, as opposed to debt covered land, which is at risk. And the, the people I met in Dubai were very nice. They did me a portfolio for my measly corporate pension. <laughs> it's, I believe it's worth around a fifth of a nurse's pension in Ireland because they get to find benefit, whereas ours is just thrown in the stock market. So it's small, but I need to do the best. So this, if you want a freeze screen or I can send it later, they picked a selection of stocks that are very low downside and potentially very high upside and are mostly around uh, resources because we're going, probably going to head into a resources, natural resources super cycle. And oil, gas and oil, gas and coal, all the green nonsense has made them really be suppressed but they're the only real energy and they're going to have to come back. So that when they invest these guys, these funds in a, an oil, gas or coal company, if the CEO begins to talk in any way about green energy or any change to sustainability, they immediately take all their capital out of that company immediately and move it to a real energy company. So it's just another tip. And I think that's it. I like that cartoon. So I thought I'd leave, finish with that. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, and one last thing, I won't go through it, but the good news, I forgot I put this in this morning. Referendum in Ireland, they tried to take the woman and the family out of the constitution. Uh, it was a disgrace, it was woke nonsense, and it was part of the society weakening I mentioned earlier. Uh, but the people threw it back in their faces two to one, even though all the parties and media and NGOs were screaming for a yes, yes, they got a no, no thrown back at them. So the people are waking up. They might not understand everything I told you, but, but they know something seriously rotten. So it's good news and loads of it's growing all over the world and in Ireland that are pushing back. Uh, I think we're all to play for on this one. Okay, <laughs> thanks. You mentioned Europe and you mentioned America.
Two questions. What is the case in the UK? And secondly, most people's debt is the mortgage. So are you actually saying they could take your house and under, if you owe money on your mortgage, they could take the lot? That's a very, the latter one first, and then I'll go back to the first one. Um, that's a specific question I would probably refer to David. My understanding would be, if you cannot clear the debt with other assets, uh, then you're exposed and the lien is kind of on the whole asset. It's possible though, it's only on the mortgaged uh, element or segment. So if you have a 400K house, 200K mortgage, if you can't clear the 200, it may be the 200K debt. Um, I'm not sure. And the first question was the UK. Broadly, I believe the UK is under the same structures. Uh, but I'd have to verify, but I'd be astounded if it wasn't. Um, it, it has to be. As you saw, Sweden and Finland were the only outliers and they had to be mopped up. I also have slides I didn't get to put in from a guy who has similar stuff showing how the, the UK government got involved in this multi-trillion dollar investment into sustainability and it shows even more kind of nasty behavior going on. It all goes back to the Crown and City of London. So I'd be stunned if it wasn't covered by the same madness. Yeah, oh, here. Can I ask, does crypto offer any um, way around this or would that be regulated? Yeah, I should have mentioned crypto. I have a little crypto, but the thing is, I'm just not trusting. I mean, it's digital, it's electronic. You know, it has to be real for me. I'm worried that some people in the business, and one guy in Dubai raised an eyebrow and said, well, who knows where crypto came from? And it could very well have come from the same bunch, you know? And there's this mysterious Japanese guy who invented Bitcoin, yet yeah, that can just be a cover story. I don't know if that's the case. And at some point they can regulate it out of existence. And then people say, oh no, if they regulate it, here's something they could do. It's being used for drugs. It's being used for crime. 99% of people don't own Bitcoin. They'll fully support having Bitcoin taken away. And then people say, no, it can't be taken away. Well, they can't damage, I believe, the Bitcoin structure. They can't take just easily, but they just make it a law that you have to present it or, or you're in serious trouble. And then you'll see the Bitcoin people, you know, have, have a soft poo moment and most of them will, will declare it. They'll be afraid. So that, it, this is, I, I, these are the worries I instinctively have with Bitcoin. Otherwise, it should be a great place. And it may very well be, but I just, yeah. Originally from Kenny Gant. Ah, oh, Kenny Gant. Right. <laughs> okay, securities include stocks, shares, government bonds, um, corporate bonds. Is that, is that right? Yeah. E everything Paper. of that nature. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, okay, you've then at the end recommended various companies to invest in, which is um, paper stocks and shares. Absolutely, yeah. So how can you do that when you say they're in danger? Well, yeah, I kind of touched on it, but I'll just say it again more clearly. So even the guys I met in Dubai, the high net worth hedge fund guys, um, they are still in the market and they know this intimately, but they're watching like a hawk. They feel, and I think they're correct, that they will see this danger coming in order to transfer out. And they believe that too. Now they could be wrong and suddenly you wake up on some morning and they've triggered this madness and the, there's an elevator to the floor with the S&P 500 and the whole thing blows up and they all get burned. Um, I'd be amazed if that was the case. They'll see it coming. And as a result, I'll see it coming. <laughs> um, so I'm, yeah. Yeah, and the second question is, when you say old paper like stocks and chairs, like companies like Weatherspoons give stocks to their employees, and Waitrose gives stocks to their employees, their shares to their employees. Yeah. So if the derivative market did crash, does that mean those employees lose 99% of their shares worth in, you know? That would, that would depend on, presumably Weatherspoons or the other guys have all of that share infrastructure in the market. And if they do, it's under this. Yeah. If they've created their own private 
stock certificate system that's completely self-contained outside of all the normal structures, I guess that would be okay, but I suspect stuff like that is gone. I mean, it's all tied into the, uh, with an umbilical cord into the, the axis of evil, you know, the great Satan of banking. People within the truth movement that have been recommending putting one's asset into trust so that you're the beneficiary. What's your view on that? I think that that's fine. Now, I, what I don't know offhand is, yeah, I think, well, I know one thing. From the way this is put together, taking any of these stocks or shares or any of these things that can be confiscated, putting them in a trust, there's no way in my mind that that could protect them because this will have legal seniority. Now, I can't say that for a fact because that question is a good one, but I'd, I'd say a private trust. But again, you're back to having physical assets with deeds in that private trust. Otherwise, it's just tied into this, this whole madness, I would guess. But these are great questions. And you know what I'll do? I'm going to send these Q&As to David uh, this evening or tomorrow, and I'll, I'll come back with answers on them. They're all recorded, right? That sound will be... Yeah, great. <laughs> yep. Uh, one question on central bank digital currencies, which we all think are probably going to come in and the masses will accept it. Uh, I know one company that's working on tech workarounds for it. Have you, what's your perspective on should it come in? Is it just a fight and hope it goes away? Or do you think tech guys out there who are freedom lovers, are, are you aware of workarounds? Yeah, I, to be honest, that's getting into pretty detailed stuff. I'm not sure, but I would say that central bank digital currency, we have to do everything humanly possible to stop it because once they get that, they then got a huge tool of coercion. Um, it's got huge implications. So everything we can do to stop it, uh, if it comes in workarounds, maybe top tech people would be pretty hard because its nature will be impenetrable. And if you need to pay people in the CBDC, you're talking perhaps you create a counterfeit digital CDCD or CBDC units of value. So you buy a car with CBDCs, everything works, but actually it turns out afterwards that wasn't actual, proper. It's possible, I'd say it'd be pretty tricky and you're going to have a lot of heavy hitters after you if you do that stuff. <laughs> it'd be tricky. It's not a question, but just speaking to David, um, I met a lady from Lebanon last year and she was saying this has already happened in the Lebanon. That's, this is, and it happened overnight and all the money was gone. And her family were quite wealthy, nothing. And then, um, as you said, they're giving them back sort of 2% of all their assets yeah. and gradually yeah. just, and they're starving, even though they have loads of money. Well, that's the deprivation that David, and I thought maybe it was a little bit of hyperbole, but then again, there's proof points. And he showed in New York after the financial crash 2008, they proved this out in case law. Now, it didn't involve individuals, it involved like kind of Lehman and banks, but they demonstrated in case law and smashed the gavel down that all of this is true and everything was moved to JP Morgan. So it's proven, and Lebanon, there's another country, an African country, I think, where they tried to go 100% digital, and again, there was mass panic and they're the armies out. So yeah, all of this is beginning to transpire. Possibly Lebanon, they've actually done it. Okay, not so, I'm gonna stay away from Lebanon then. <laughs> I think the last one more question. One more, we'll do two quickies for quick. Uh, just to uh, clarify, I mean, I'll do it myself, but um, presumably when you say physical gold, you also include physical silver, which, yeah, is, liable to out, which is liable to outperform. Could very well. I mean, the gold-silver ratio now is at a very unusual rate, and silver, by all means, could really shoot up when gold is going up, which it is. But to be honest, that would be, for me, speculative, because I, I know what I know, but I, yeah, it's speculative, I'm not sure. But gold and silver, for sure, and commodities, as I said, uranium, uh, and all the commodities could be a good thing. You were talking about the, um, the crash or the implosion. Um, so I've been thinking just recently, or well, I thought it a while ago actually, but um, do you feel that this is their inept launch in the CBDC? I've been feeling that for a while because what they need for CBDC is a crisis. And all my other talks that go through like Sandy's material kind of and, and uh, Rockefeller does a huge amount of that discussion. 
Um, they need a crisis to get through the really bad stuff. So the perfect crisis to get the CBDC over the line with the people is, of course, a financial crisis. Yeah. Because, yeah, they could do a pandemic, but they can't do another pandemic because, in fairness, people are not going to swallow that nonsense next time, at least not for 10 or 15 years, and the goldfish forget, <laughs> sadly. But financial disaster, I mean, if people on the street don't understand virology, epidemiology, immunology, and they don't, and that's how you fool them with that nonsense, uh, they certainly overwhelmingly don't have a clue about financial technology. For example, um, there is this crash, and they introduced the CBDC. <coughs> so none of us are going to want to use the CBDC. And also, it then follows that none of us are going to want to exchange what cash we have at home. Obviously, I don't suppose we'd be able to get it out of the bank from that point, but say we've got some at home. So I was kind of thinking that, given that we don't want to use that system, and if they're saying to us, oh, we can exchange your cash at home for X CBDC, mm. why don't we just keep their currency, which is very difficult to copy, you know, they've made sure that it's got all these security features, so why don't we just keep their cash and use it for ourselves as our own separate uh, our own separate economy. Is there, is there cash as our currency for exchanging goods? I mean, we can trade amongst ourselves, we can we Absolutely. can barter services, but why not keep that currency and use it for ourselves? I agree totally with that, and that's fine. Now, when they bring in CBDC as well, currently all these, these uh, scumbags, they say, oh, there'll still be cash. They're maintaining that, I don't know if it's true, but they may allow it and then slowly and inexorably squeeze cash. But even if they go and say there's no cash, you can physically keep what's there and use it. I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, of course. But they may bring it in and keep cash because they figure they won't get away bringing it in alone for a short time. But then the key is for everyone is to keep using cash in reality and maybe at some point if they say it's gone, to still use it. Yeah. I got, uh, yeah. Achilles heel. They got an Achilles heel. Yeah. These people got Achilles heel. Achilles. So the whole legal system is sea law. It's nothing to do with the land at all. Right? So also the assets, including the minerals, including gold, is physical assets. It's on the land and inside the land. It's not in the sea. So all the corporations are a piece of paper. Even the UN is a piece of paper. All the countries are, are fake. All the governments are fake because they're all corporations. So we can take all the shit down. True, true, maybe in principle. No, but in reality. Oh, it, but yeah. in reality, during COVID, technically, no, 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 you, no, no, you no, could no. say the same thing, but no, the, they got... I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something no. different. It's another conversation for another time. Okay. But yeah. just saying they've got massive Achilles heel. It's an Achilles heel, but they've also got quite a lot of power. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> No, and I think awareness of the people is, and Richard mentioned earlier, is crucial. David said the same thing. Nordengard says the same thing. All these great people are saying the same thing. If we get enough awareness, it will actually head this stuff off at the pass. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you,